afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives. It's a, a pleasure to have everyone uh, here today and for all those who are going to be viewing the program over the internet. So this is very exciting. As you all know, this is NARA's 75th anniversary year. And we've had a series of programs focusing not only on our, our past and our history, but, but looking forward. And this afternoon's pr panel is looking forward. So our panel is looking at 75 years, the National Archives from a community perspective. As we all know, um, we are here uh, for a variety of purposes, but above all, we're here for the users who take advantage of the vast resources that we have. Matter of fact, uh, in the green room just before this, we were talking about some of those vast resources and the challenges in getting access to them. So it's a subject of, of very great interest and great importance. Not only here at the National Archives in Washington, but in our presidential libraries, our regional archives and record centers, the question of access, the question of users, the question of, of uh, using our vast resources is very important to us. And we're in a world that is so rapidly changing with the technology kind of developing at a dizzying pace. Expectations, I think, with the new administration about access, transparency, accountability, and openness, that uh, this is a topic that is very, very significant for the National Archives. And it's a topic in which there's a lot of discussion going on in the administration and in the government at large on these issues, and NARA is very much a part of that. So we've asked several very prominent uh, researchers who have used the resources of the National Archives to uh, bring that experience to bear that they've had here on the National Archives of the past and the future. So there are a lot of questions as you look ahead over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Will there be researchers in our research rooms? We're making a tremendous effort on digitization, which we hope to vastly expand. How is that going to impact research? What is the future and what's NARA's role in it? So moderated uh, today by uh, David McMillan, who I'll introduce formally in just a moment. The other panelists that we're honored to have with us today include H.W. Brands, who's a presidential historian and professor of history at the University of Texas in Austin. We have Margot Anderson, a federal historian and professor of history at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Megan Smolinak, who is the chief family historian and spokesperson for Ancestry.com, who's one of our partners in our digitization efforts, by the way. And Donald Ritchie, associate historian at the U.S. Senate Historical Office. And Michael Dobbs from the Washington Post reporter, author of One Minute to Midnight, Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro on the Brink of Nuclear War. So it's, it's, it's an honor to have you here. We're grateful for your giving us your time and your experience. Let me introduce our moderator for this afternoon, David McMillan. David has been with the National Archives since November of 2005, and he is the, our ex Director of External Affairs um, for the National Archives and Records Administration, so he really does the outreach to a variety of user groups, professional organizations, and others who are stakeholders at NARA. Also, from May of 2006 until September of 2008, he also served as our Director of Congressional Relations. He's had extensive experience on the Hill, both on the Senate side and on the uh, House side, as uh, he's done work on census, education, information systems, the federal statistical system, computer security, and last but not least, the archives. And David's academic background really prepared him very well for his work on the Hill. He a, has a PhD in applied social statistics from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And he has a master's degree in literature and linguistics from Carnegie Mellon University, a very interesting combination. And as a result, he's published a number of books and journals on popular culture, migration, population projection methodology, and survey methodology. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to David McMillan. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was very kind of you. Um, these are great devices, but I hope all of you have turned them off by now. I'm turning mine off right now, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us today in the ongoing celebration of the 75th anniversary of the National Archives. 75 years ago this Friday, June 19th, President Roosevelt signed the legislation creating the National Archives. A year earlier, President Hoover laid the cornerstone for this building, and in 1935, the staff moved in. We also have to acknowledge, however, the work of historians and politicians who worked for decades before that to make the National Archives a reality. The executive and, legis the executive and legislative branches saw preserving the raw materials of history a worthy effort, despite the hardships of the economic climate of the early 1930s. And as those men and women who first started the National Archives set out to build the institution, it was not unlike the task faced by those charged with organizing the Homeland Security Department. Both faced the task of creating a unified system out of a myriad of agencies, each having its own way of doing things. It was not long before those agencies were sending boxes of, record, boxes of records at a pace faster than the archives could keep up with. That problem continues today. In a stunning act of bureaucratic blindness, the Hoover Commission stripped the National Archives of its independence in 1949 and made it an agency within the General Services Administration. Boxes of paper are boxes of paper. Some new, some used. Managing them should be much the same thing, they thought. The consequences of that mistake still haunt the agency today. What the Hoover Commission failed to realize was that the National Archives was far more than the raw materials of history. It is the bedrock of open government, a go of a government that derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Today, as an independent agency, the public looks to the National Archives to protect the public's right to know, the right to measure that consent through access to records of agencies. Congress turns to the National Archives not just for the celebration of the past, but to assure the public's right of informed, ensure that the public's right of informed consent is protected. We have with us today five distinguished scholars who have mined the boxes of records in the National Archives to tell us about our government and our people. For 20 years, the Census Bureau denied its involvement in the internment of the Japanese during World War II. Margot Anderson searched the records of the War Department and the FBI and other agencies and documented that the Census Bureau was an active participant in that effort. As a result, then director of the Census Bureau, Kenneth Pruitt, apologized to the American public for the agency's actions. H.W. Brands, in addition to writing about Presidents Wilson, Wilson and Jackson, taught us that the Cold War was fueled by the endless search for foreign enemies by which Americans need to affirm their identity and basic goodness. The American desire to save the world, according to Brands, determined the fervor with which the Cold War was waged. Michael Dobbs' trilogy has used records in the National Archives to expand our understanding of the Cuban Missile Crisis and is currently, is currently researching the origins of the Cold War at the FDR Library in Hyde Park, the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, and at Archives II in College Park. Donald Ritchie reminds us that the National Archives houses the records of Congress as well as those of the executive branch and has written extensively on the relationship between Congress and the press. Megan Smolniak brings home to us that the National Archives is not just national history, but personal history as well. Genealogists comprise the largest single, um, largest single group of researchers at the National Archives and are at the cutting edge of research in the electronic age. When the 1920 census was released on April 1st, 1992, genealogists and reporters lined up around the block to get access to those records. By April 1st, 2002, the lines were much shorter, almost none at all. In a matter of weeks, Ancestry.com had the 1930 census online and within six months had produced an index for those records. For many historians, the grist for their mills will continue to be the papers in our boxes. However, the work of genealogists illustrates the future that awaits us. Today, in partnership with Footnotes, we are digitizing 1.2 million widows' pension files from the Civil War. The electronic availability of those records will advance both genealogy and history. Thank you for being here, and let me turn the podium over to Margo Anderson. Thank you, David, and everyone. Uh, and this is a real honor to be here. Um, I have a um, uh, 
this, this has given me the occasion to sort of think back and realize that I have been researching in the National Archives for almost half the uh, agency's existence, over 35 years when I started as a very green graduate student in the, in the 1970s. Uh, next slide, pre please. Um, that research has borne fruit. Um, here are books that I've written. I specialize mostly in uh, the history of the federal statistical system and census taking. And, uh, and so these are works that have come directly out of the archives, in particular, uh, much of the material in this building, Record Group 29. Next slide, please. I, what I thought I would do today was talk about um, my experience as a researcher. Uh, I'm uh, located in Wisconsin, although I always I haven't always lived there, but I've, um, I put on the map, I pulled up a United States map and said, okay, what is it like to research in the National Archives? Next slide, please. And I realized this isn't quite as bright as I would have liked, but I realized that that I have that for me the National Archives is not just this building, but uh, facilities all over the country, uh, presidential libraries, the regional libraries, uh, Nara II, uh, Suitland, and many many other places. And these and I have so therefore been have over the years traveled to. Uh, these particular locations to find bits and pieces of records and materials to, to sort of build uh, the history of uh, the federal statistics system and essentially the history of the American population and population development and migration. Next slide, please. Um, so for my very particular small piece of the world, statistical data collection um, is a but much like the archives, um, is a, is a government-wide activity. Um, and, and because it affects the entire government, um, it is, one needs to look sort of across the government, not only in the particular ag statistical agencies, but how those uh, records have been used by uh, other agencies. And of course, I also go into private um, and collections and state records and so forth. It's also a very venerable, the statistical system is a venerable government institution um, founded you know, right after the, um, the, with the state. And so going back to the census of 1890, which of course makes the ancestry.com type of world of family genealogy possible. We have been in the United States collecting information for over 200 years on uh, the uh, statistical description of the country. Um, it also requires interagency cooperation, so um, so the uh, I explore myriad record groups. Next slide, please. So I started in some sense with commerce, um, uh, with uh, with census, and and I'm out there today, look at, still looking at more because the wonderful thing about the archives is new records keep coming in. And uh, it's always interesting to go back and sort of revisit even some of the ones that you've already looked at for new insights. But then, as David has indicated, uh, those records have driven have taken me into many other places, you know, in other agencies. And uh, the next slide, please. Um, and keeping and con and in particular, my work on the. Uh, evacuation of the Japanese in, from the West Coast in World War II has taken me into a lot of the military records. Next slide, please. So what I've learned from all this, public archives are a national treasure and are, um, and the archives also set standards that um, state and local archives, private archives, university archives, you know, have to measure themselves by. And, and that's a very important national standard. Um, the National Archivists are a treasure. Uh, just a very simple practical question that I couldn't find all these record groups and learn the indexing systems and the organization of the records without being able to also have access to the archivists who serve us all. Um, and in, in my 35 years, our, it, obviously things have changed. There are many new facilities, and the NARA II did not exist um, in the 1970s. Um, and the new forms of record distribution, in particular the digital uh, universe and the digital preservation and access, which I also deal with to, to a certain extent with census material uh, and manuscript issues. Um, 
but my conclusion to here uh, this afternoon is that there will always be a need to sort of go to the records and be able to know that there is access available. And in that sense, um, the original vision from uh, 1934 um, still exists. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Dobbs. I recently wrote a book about the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis called One Minute to Midnight, which appeared last year. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, actually, if we could go back to the last one. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how I used records at the National Archives to research my book. Um, I'm going to talk today just about the visual records I used, because very often uh, when people think about the National Archives, they think about the written records. But uh, I found that in researching my book, the visual records were in some ways just as important as all the written records that, are at the, that you can find at the archives. Um, photographs, other visual records help a writer um, recreate scenes, um, give life to uh, the story that you're trying to tell. But more than that, I think also uh, some visual records can give you in very important clues about what actually happened that are missing from the uh, written records. And I'm going to give you three examples of that uh, related to my book on the missile crisis. Uh, I was trying to give a moment by moment, R by R narrative of what it's like uh, to, uh, of, of a, the gravest national security crisis you can imagine. And I was trying to tell that story from the perspective of Kennedy and his aides in the White House, and also from the perspective of everything else that was happening around the world, in Cuba, in the Soviet Union, in the United States. Uh, one of the key questions at the time that Kennedy kept on uh, putting to his intelligence people was, where are the nuclear warheads? Uh, US uh, reconnaissance planes and had photographed the missiles so we knew very well, or the president knew very well, where the missiles were. But the key question in October 1962 that he had to answer was when the warheads would be mated with the uh, missiles, because uh, the missiles couldn't be fired until they were mated with the warheads. The CIA was never able to answer that question. Uh, with the help of records uh, in the National Archives, finally, 42 years later, I've been able to resolve that question of where the uh, warheads were held, uh, were stored, and when they could have been mated uh, with the uh, missiles that were aimed at the United States. Um, this is just a Google map of uh, the Havana area. I had visited Russia and talked with um, people who actually handled the warheads, and they told me about this nuclear warhead bunker, the place near Behukal. Um, but I didn't know exactly where the bunker was, and uh, I needed, I wanted to have documentary support for these interviews that I was undertaking in Russia. Next slide, please. Now, as it happens, the US compiled an extraordinary documentary record of the missile crisis from the beginning, from the first day. They did so by flying both uh, U-2 high-level planes and uh, low-level US Air Force and US Navy planes over the island every single day of the missile crisis photographing what was going on. This gives us a minute-by-minute minute record of what was happening in Cuba during those crucial 13 days. Uh, this is a unique photograph, uh, never published before my book, of a US Air Force plane entering Cuba at the height of the missile crisis. Now, these planes were armed not with uh, weapons, but with uh, cameras. There was a camera in the uh, nose of the plane, there was a vertical camera in the uh, bottom of the plane here, and there were also uh, side cameras that took um, horizontal shots. Uh, this, uh, the reason I have this photograph is that the planes entered the island in pairs, and uh, sometimes they took photographs of each other. Of course, these photographs were never published at the time because they were uninteresting to the policymakers, but they're very interesting to historians, uh, uh, and this is a, a unique photograph of a US military plane overflying Cuba at the height of the missile crisis, taken from the other military plane. Next slide, please. Um, so I did my research in Russia, and I was told about uh, uh, the movement of warheads around the uh, island, 
But in order to establish exactly what happened, I had to go to the National Archives here in College Park, and it, the process is rather akin to looking for needles in haystacks. Um, you see these cans of film down here, uh, which it I found out late in my research process uh, from one of the CIA phot photo interpreters that all these cans of film, uh, ten tens of thousands of them, uh, had been uh, transferred to the National Archives. Nobody knew about it. I finally found that uh, they had all been deposited in a um, gravel pit. I'm not sure if it is a gravel pit because I haven't been down there, but some kind of subterranean facility in uh, Kansas. Uh, so I was able, you were able to order 20 of these cans at a time. I brought, they were brought up to me uh, to College Park and I was able to uh, look through them and find some interesting stuff. Next slide, please. Um, this is just three photographs. Um, uh, it doesn't tell you much by looking at the photographs, but next slide, please. Um, I superseded this, put the, one of the, some of these photographs on top of Google Earth, and I established exactly where the nuclear warhead storage center was at this place called Behukar. The giveaway are these vans. Next, please. Next slide, please. Um, that's a close-up of the nuclear warhead storage vans, very specially configured, um, that were going to transport the warheads around Cuba and were based at this particular site. Next slide, please. The CIA um, you know, had photographs like this. Uh, they analyzed them, but they saw this, uh, uh, they, they saw there was, it was protected only by one fence. So the CIA analysts, when they uh, looked at the, uh, at the photographs, they um, dismissed this and said the nuclear warheads couldn't possibly be stored at this site. Next slide, please. Um, but this, in fact, um, was the central nuclear warhead storage bunker in Cuba during the missile crisis. And as I said, the giveaway is these uh, nuclear warhead vans. Next slide, please. OK, second example. Um, on the height of the crisis on October 27th, uh, the, uh, Castro decided to fire at uh, US planes overflying Cuba. This, was a, this is a photograph of a, US, of a Soviet missile site in Cuba that was public, publicly released by the Kennedy administration back in 1962. It's a little bit too difficult to decipher, uh, but there are missiles. Uh, it sort of says where the missiles are. It says uh, you know, various vehicles associated with the missile site and so on. It's in a place called San Cristobal. Next slide, please. Um, I got the original uh, film. Um, you know, which didn't show, this is actually the uh, photograph that was published, and this is the next photograph. Next slide, please. Again, the photograph that is published, exactly the same one, but without the CIA labels. Next slide, please. Now, what the interesting thing about this shot is that this is a split second after the first photograph that I showed you. The, at, in the interval of that split second, uh, Cuban anti-aircraft guns are firing at the pilot the pilot uh, then uh, uh, pulls his steering wheel to the left and makes a, his getaway over the, um, over the mountains of Cuba back to Florida. So this, again, is a kind of, I, th uh, I think, is an extraordinary historical document recording the precise time. And there's even a photograph, in, uh, a, a camera embedded in, in some of the film uh, when uh, Cuban anti-aircraft guns fired at uh, US, low-level US uh, uh, planes overflying Cuba. Next slide, please. I just want to end with um, the third example uh, that I was able to put together of an extraordinary incident that took place at the height of the missile crisis, on the most dangerous day of the missile crisis, when this man, a man called Charles Maltzby, uh, uh, flying a U-2 on a very routine mission around Alaska ended up over the Soviet Union on the most dangerous day of the missile crisis, um, at the peak of the missile crisis, in fact. Uh, the following day, Khrushchev complains to Kennedy that he says, you know, that this, this incident could have caused an, a nuclear exchange. There's very little records about this. The records are still classified. The records that I was able to find uh, are the uh, are maps uh, that, for some reason, uh, escaped the 
the, the classification process. Next slide, please. This is Maltzby's U2 that overflew, uh, that he was meant to go to the North Pole, come back, but instead of going to the North Pole, he was blinded by the aurora borealis, ends up over the Soviet territory on the most dangerous day of the missile crisis. Next slide, please. You know, sometimes researchers have a eureka moment. You can spend days, uh, uh, weeks, months in the archives, everything, it's very routine, boring work, and then suddenly you find something that kind of puts all the elements of the jigsaw puzzle together. And uh, this is a document that I found uh, in a completely unexpected place uh, in the State Department archives. It's not labeled, there are no classification markings, which is one reason why it probably got released when everything else is still classified. It shows the precise uh, track of uh, Maltzby's flight on the 27th of October, 1962. Uh, and his overflight of the Soviet Union, um, it's difficult to interpret here, but these are the times when he entered the Soviet territory. These are Soviet MiGs that are trying to go up and shoot him down. Next slide, please. So I took that information um, and I just put it on a Google Earth map. And uh, this map shows uh, when Maltzby entered Soviet territory uh, when he left Soviet territory, he was about an hour and a quarter over Soviet territory. It shows Soviet MiGs trying to uh, go up and shoot him down um, from two different places, and it shows uh, US F 102s scrambling from uh, an Air Force base in Alaska to head off these Soviet MiGs that are believed to be coming across the Bering Straits. Actually, this is when we really needed Sarah Palin on the job, <laughs> sort of looking across the Bering Straits and doing something about these uh, Soviet MiGs that were threatening. Um, so I was able to use that map that you saw to, I integrated it with what I knew that was happening in the Oval Office. I established when uh, Maltzby entered Soviet territory. I found out when the president was informed about this. It was not until uh, Maltzby had already exited Soviet territory at about, uh, and was approaching, coming back to Alaska, that uh, somebody summed up the courage and said, had the courage to say, inform the president that we have a U-2 plane missing over the Soviet Union. Kennedy's reaction was, there's always some son of a bitch that doesn't get the word. This was uh, hitherto practically, uh, or very little described, um, very poorly understood incident at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis that I was able, I think, to decipher and tell the story uh, in large part because of uh, the records at the National Archives. Thank you very much.